Hi, everyone. Justin here. Uh, fair warning, if you don't know the professional wrestler Goldust, if you don't know who that is, uh, stop the podcast. Go look up Goldust. Go on YouTube, maybe search Goldust, watch a few promo interviews. Uh It'll give you uh, some context towards what seems like maybe an inside joke between Jordan and Sid, one of the founders of Wild Kombucha, uh, on today's episode. So, let's start this one, right? Welcome to episode 43. Is this episode 43? I think this is episode 43 of the Chocolate Croissants podcast. I'm Justin. I'm here to give you a brief introduction before you hop into the episode. So today our guests were the boys from Wild Kombucha, Sid, Adam, and Sergio, uh, three dudes who grew up with one another, uh, were cutting their teeth together, and ended up starting a kombucha company together. They, uh, They really highlight the entrepreneurial spirit, um, and their ups and downs are inspiring to say the least. I think anyone who is looking to start an endeavor, a business on their own, uh, or with a group of friends like these three guys, this is the podcast for you. They they dealt with a lot of ups and downs. Um, they faced a lot of adversity, and they were able to come out on the other side with a pretty incredible, <clears throat> excuse me, a pretty incredible business that I'm inspired by, and I think Jordan and Matt were inspired by as well. What was really cool about this episode, kind of like the last episode where we were on location dealing with something different, this episode dealt with uh, a new variable for us. We only use four microphones, and so Matt and I shared a microphone. Jordan had his own, and then the kombucha gents, the wild kombucha gents, the three of them shared two microphones together. So we thought this would be a bit of a cluster. It ended up being great, and it all worked out. So that was super cool. I don't want to give away too much of the episode, I think you should just jump head in. So let me give uh, a quick shout out to Rode. I'm currently using the NT-USB microphone. You can check all of their microphones out, all of the gear that they sell at Rode.com. I think all of their socials are slash Rode Mic. That's R-O-D-E-M-I-C. Simple enough, right? And again, I'm using the Rode NT-USB to record this intro, and we use the Rode Procaster's which I think is really made for voice, for uh, capturing vocals, um, and uh, it always works out great for us. So shout out to Rode being the sponsor this week. Uh, They've been with us since the beginning, and they're always nothing but supportive and great. So thank you, Rode, R-O-D-E. Google search it, check it out, see what it's like, right? And go from there. I also want to give a shout out to Goldust because uh, Goldust gave uh, me a lot of comedy this week between Jordan and Sid for keeping the the reference of Sid's favorite wrestler as Goldust. I hope he wins the Royal Rumble tonight. Uh, Let me know if you watched it because this will come out uh, the day after the Royal Rumble. You guys into professional wrestling? Are you guys into kombucha? Do you know what kombucha is? Do you know who Goldust is? These are all questions that I'm currently thinking about. So uh, please join our Facebook group if you haven't already at facebook.com slash groups slash chocolate croissants. Again, facebook.com slash groups slash chocolate croissants and uh, answer those questions. I think those, do you know who Goldust is? Were you surprised by who won Royal Rumble? Did you watch the Royal Rumble? Do you know what kombucha is? Are you a fan of booch? What did you learn from this episode? What are your takeaways? Are you going to go make kombucha now? Have you tried wild kombucha? I have tons of questions. Join us in the Facebook group, facebook.com slash group slash chocolate croissants. Yeah, I think that's enough. So welcome to episode 44, 43, 44, one of them with the wild kombucha gents. Okay, uh, it's Jordan. I'm in my apartment with five young men and some jingle bells. 
So uh, six, if you count Tyson. Uh, that's true. Uh, oh, oh, by the way, this dog Tyson sometimes he farts when there's company. Uh, just giving you that heads up. Uh, and with that, welcome. We're here with Adam and Sid and Sergio from Wild Kombucha. Uh, they they make and they sell this stuff. And uh, I, in this conversation, am going to be the ignorant one. Uh, this is the first time I've ever had a bottle of it. Uh, Justin, he's Justin's made some. You, you scogies. <laughs> is that what it is? <laughs> right? And you ferment them? I made a scoby. Like scoby. A, yep, yep, I did. Uh, Maria, shout out to Maria, who asked a bunch of questions in the Facebook group, showed me the ways. We did some FaceTiming, and she, she taught me how to make a mother scoby. Mm-hmm. Anybody? Yeah. 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 Okay, a mother scoby. And then, yeah, I made kombucha. However, that is trash now. Okay, well, point being, I've tried it before. You have. This is the first time I've had it out of a bottle with some really nice design wrapped around the bottle. And this is ginger grapefruit. And you guys have, what, five or six of these now? Yeah, we have five flavors right now. Okay. Uh, you know what I'm thinking? Ginger grapefruit, mango peach, elderberry, apple spice, and watermelon hops. Well, And Matt, you're drinking? I'm drinking the mango peach. And I'm not just saying this because you guys are here. Uh, and Justin can back this up. We went to the Health Expo recently when it was in town, and we tried a whole bunch of kombucha. And your brand is by far my favorite, like hands down above the rest. Thank you. Nice. Um, because a lot, I think a lot of kombuchas can be tough to drink. Like there's a lot of um, carbonation in a lot of them. So you know, and it's the kind of thing where I, you know, I like it because it's thirst quenching and it's good for you. Um, and your guys has a really good balance between flavor and it's not too carbonated, in my opinion. So that I really enjoy it. And the flavors are great. The flavors are, are totally different than what I've seen elsewhere, too. So kudos to you. Um, so I think this is going to be a clusterfuck, especially for the listeners, because there's three new voices. Um, and I don't know how uh, they're going to tell you guys apart. But could you just go through real quick, um, say your name, and then... Uh, your favorite pro wrestler. Hold on. Don't do that. <laughs> Jordan, can Sid you Sharma, get it together? Gold dust. Fuck. Yes. All yes. right. All right. So I, I wrote down a bunch of questions that are actually important to the podcast because not all of our <laughs> listeners. Okay. So th- here's two, two and one, and whoever wants to answer this can, but um, there are probably a lot of people out there that don't know what kombucha is. So question one, part one, what is kombucha? Part two of that question, how did you guys become passionate about it? And then question number two is... All right, slow down. Hey, what was the first question? (laughs) Your name and favorite wrestler. Uh, Sid Sharma, Gold Dust. (laughs) Oh, my God. Sergio Malarin, The Rock, because it's the only one I know. All right. I have no idea of any names in pro wrestling. Thank you. But my name is Adam, though. Okay, so (laughs) I know my name. Adam, what is kombucha? Kombucha is a healthy probiotic, bubbly drink. It's good for your immune system, gut, digestion. Yeah, it's pretty. It's, uh, it's made from fermented gr- uh, tea. We use green tea uh, and organic juices. Our tea is actually uh, fair trade as well as organic. Um, we source it from a region in China that's specific to kombucha brewing. Um, <clears throat> and then all the juices we, we add uh, midway through the fermentation and it kickstarts a secondary fermentation similar to a technique that winemakers use where it actually the secondary fermentation uh, raises the pH slightly and gives it a clean balanced finish. Okay, so how did this all start for you guys? I have so many questions. How did it start? Who speaks Chinese? Who travels to China? How do you do the fair trade? I mean, I could go all day. Like you torn a band, how the hell do you balance that with running the company? So, let's just start with uh, it, it, that, oh, it started Christ. with Sergio and <laughs> Thank I. You. Um, okay. Yeah, so, I mean, we've been surrounded by fermentation our whole life. Our family has been doing it um, since we were, like, since we... Eight years eight old. Eight years old, or, maybe, yeah. yeah. We did, like, sauerkraut and kefir and just, like, everything. And, like, it was always a really positive thing when we did it with our family. So it was, uh, it was like, whenever we think back to it, it was always very nostalgically positive. Yeah. Um, when you and got, then I when started the company... Um, uh, and then I kind of um, 
Sergio went, was going through a tough time um, and he was staying at my house for a little bit. Um, and that's when we started talking about working together and, uh, and we, we started planning it when he was just living in my attic, literally. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess to give it from, from my perspective, um, <clears throat> so I was, I was living in Adam's attic and I was working for a company called Thompson Creek, which is like a, a window home improvement company in the area. And I was doing a kind of a hybrid position for them, like sales slash marketing. And so, uh, during, you know, during the, my downtime at the job and taking what I'd learned there, I started doing market research and that's what kind of brought me to the table with Adam because he was already selling to Hopkins students and uh, already had two of the flavors, uh, the, the ginger grapefruit and mango peach. Uh, he was already making those and selling those uh, on a very small scale. And so I was the one who brought this vision for something uh, a little bit bigger uh, that would take, you know, several of us. Um, and then we started discussing it, fleshed it out, put what little money we'd earned and brought Sid on board. And pretty yeah, the everything company, uh, we just drained our bank accounts yeah. completely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it. it's yeah. it's pretty crazy. We started this company with less than twenty twenty thousand dollars. I mean, may, maybe fifteen. I think less. Maybe so, what less, year was yeah. this when you all three came together? Twenty fourteen. Fourteen. Yeah. Yeah. The spring. The spring of twenty fourteen. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, Adam, you were hustling this stuff to Hopkins students. Yeah, they would just come to my house and just pick it up. It was it was it was pretty crazy. Like, I posted I actually posted an ad on Craigslist, like I you know, to pick up kombucha six packs from my house, and just like all these people hit me up, and just came picked it up from my house. I would start delivering it too. I was delivering it to like their houses, um, and I was doing like was it bottled? Yeah, I would bottle it, and they would return the bottles, and I would give them like a cheaper um, price on the next round. Um, I was doing that for for a couple of years. Before the business started, actually. Did you always see it as as a way to make money, or or was a lot of it just this I passion didn't for really the product? make money? No, yeah, it was just like I, I don't even know what I was thinking, honestly. At that point, I was just like doing it because I love to do it, and people loved it. And like, and then after like maybe a year of doing it, I was started to like dawn on me that like maybe I should bring it to the next level. And then perfect timing, Sergio. Yeah, Adam was yeah. the one who really like perfected the kombucha. When when we made it as a family, I mean, one out of maybe ten times it was good, and the rest was borderline undrinkable. Like I remember playing a prank on Sid when we were in high school. He came over to my house. I was like, "Hey, man, you want some OJ?" He was like, "Sure, <laughs> sure." I poured him a big glass of kombucha, and he like started gulping it down because we were really thirsty. I think we just like come back from playing soccer or something. And, he ends up like taking a couple of big gulps and almost like throwing it back up, <laughs> just like gagging for a couple of minutes. Um, and so Adam was the one who really perfected the recipes and then trained me and later Sid on how to brew in his style. How did you end up choosing one or the others of the stuff that the families were making growing up, whether it was kefir, kefir um, or the sauerkrauts? Why kombucha over everything else? I mean, it's a good question, actually. Um, I think it's the easiest to make. Yeah, it's super easy to make. So I mean, I would make it um, even before I was selling it. I'd make it, and all my roommates would drink it. Um, and it just—I mean, once a week, I would just spend like an hour doing it. And you know, with sa sauerkraut, it takes a lot more time because you got to shred the sauerkraut and like, like yeah. It's and I think the market for something like kombucha is much more tangible. You know, how often do you grab a random drink to enjoy? much more often than you might grab pickled vegetables or, or um, other fermented foods. Why do you guys think kombucha is having its moment in our culture right now? I think people are sick of soda. They're starting to realize that people are putting tons of chemicals and things that aren't good for you into these beverages and often listing them as random things such as, such as spices or labeling it as a um, natural as, flavor as a natural flavor or, or markets secret so they don't have to put it on the label. Uh, people want to know what's going into their food and they want something that's that's good for them that is actually coming from from fruits and natural natural um, ingredients. I would even take it a step further and say like uh, I think there's just a at least in in where we are right now in Baltimore but I think it's across the world there's this, uh, rise in consciousness. Uh, I think it's 
you know, you can just look around and see it in, in everywhere, you know, from what people are eating and drinking, consuming, to things like, you know, the Me Too movement. There's this greater awakening consciousness, and we were just fortunate enough that we, it, we happened to have a product that fit that at the exact same time. You know, it's, it's sometimes serendipity, but, you know. You can... Do you feel like it was also serendipitous that a few years ago it was when a, a lot of people, um, higher public figures of the health proponent world, started to talk about the gut microbiome and how important it was for probiotics and prebiotics and taking care of what's kind of on the inside to take care of what's on the outside? Yeah, I mean, we've definitely been fortunate with our timing but I do think a big piece of that is we finally had enough years um, of a lot of these manufactured foods that have these chemicals that we're starting to see the negative effects. Yeah. You know, it used to be a lot of these companies could deny the effects of things like soda saying, oh, co correlation's not causation. But I mean, it's a fact that diabetes has increased in this country as a result of these sugary foods. So people are realizing that what you put in your body is what you get out. Sid, I'm curious, what were you doing prior to this company? So when we originally epic stuff. <laughs> when we originally started, um, I was down in North Carolina getting my master's in environmental management um, with a focus in entrepreneurship. So I ended up working for a local energy consulting firm. Um, but actually before that, which relates a little bit more to this company, I was doing pancreatic cancer research at Johns Hopkins. Um, and just through those experiences on the sustainability side from the environmental program and the cancer research, I started to realize just the effect that food can have on a, on a person and in general your behavior, whether you're exercising, um, and how important that can be in a life. Very cool. So uh, one that helps me understand why you guys would be like, yo, we should include this dude because he's I like... I'm still trying to figure out why I'm here. Well, <laughs> no. well. so I'm curious. So it's like, all right, you have this product. You have some interest in the marketplace locally. Uh, you guys now all three decide, let's do this together. What happens next? Yeah, that was my question. Like, can you, um, can you start where we are now and then go backwards, you know, and kind of explain how it came together? So maybe it is like, you know, you said spring of 2015? 14. 14. Uh, 14, you came together. Um, what were the role, like, what are your guys' roles at that point? What are your roles in the company now? Um, yeah, and how, how did it get to where it is now? Yeah, so I'll, I guess I'll start a little bit at the beginning. So when we first started, you know, everyone has to make the product. You know, we're bottling by hand, we're brewing by hand, putting on the labels by hand. It's, it's a lot of manual labor. So really the first step was to find a space that we could operate out of. So we found this side of a juice shop in Hamden um, where we could piggyback off of their commercial license in order to make our product after work and on weekends whenever we were free. Um, so at that point, you know, it was really just utilizing whatever hours we had. And when we weren't making the product, um, we'd throw a cooler over our shoulder and walk down the street and see who was willing to work with us. Like 15-hour days. Yeah. Like crazy. All of us had full-time jobs at that point. Um, Adam was working uh, at Wegmans as a pharmacy tech. Sid was working as an energy consultant, and I was working as a manager for Thompson Creek. So we would finish our jobs. You know, We would all go to work around 7 or 8 in the morning, finish at like 5, 6 in the afternoon, and then brew and bottle from about, I mean, like 8 o'clock at night till 1 in the morning. Uh Luckily, we all had lots of uh, enthusiasm and adrenaline from starting the company, so that kind of rolls you through that first bit, which is like absolutely brutal, and you will not do it unless you have tons of enthusiasm for it. Um, it's kind of one of the big barriers to entry for most entrepreneurs. Yep. Yeah, I'm pretty sure my consulting firm thought that thought that I had something going on that was crazy because I'd show up the next day in the same clothes, looking all disheveled because I crashed at Sergio's place. <laughs> But um, so we started really operating in February 2015, to give you a timeline. Um, and then on August 10th, 2015, we landed Whole Foods as a client. And on August 11th, 2015, we all quit our jobs. 
Okay, so a, a lot has to happen in order to land Whole Foods. So even just the fact, and, and Adam, you may have like figured this out before it became this three-man team, but even just like design and for the the brand, like are you who <laughs> made the labels? Like, are you using at that point? Are you leveraging you know social media? Uh, who's doing that? Um, so so I guess in that point. Did you all kind of have these different skills? Um, I mean, I know you mentioned you had did marketing and things like that. It was uh, a lot of it was just uh, kind of pulling on our uh, separate social networks. So for the labels, for example, uh, one of my buddies, Paul, his sister who does a film out in New York City, she did the labels for us for you know maybe two hundred, three hundred bucks. And uh, as a favor, because she knew how to use, uh, I think it's Photoshop or one of those programs. Um, a lot of it was just, yeah, like friends would help us sometimes, like bottle. Like we'd recruit people. We started in Hamden, so we'd go down to Frazier's and like recruit our friends when the bar would close to like help us out. Like even if it was just like, you know, cleaning up, mopping the floors, you just like, hey, we'll, like, we'll give you some kombucha, come help us out. Um, it was a lot of that, recruiting our friends. Uh, I would say the biggest challenge right off the bat, though, was finding a spot like that was very very difficult and took us a year from the time we we the three of us got together it took us a full year to have a place that we could operate out of legally um big big part of that was uh occupancy like the zoning and occupancy that was a, a big hurdle for us yeah and definitely early on so much of it is just tied to the willingness to hustle mm -hmm. you know the way we got bottles, a lot of people look at it as pretty crazy. So uh, we worked with this, this brewery called Ruhlman Brewery, and they would get pallets of bottles, but we couldn't roll a pallet into the size of this juice shop. So we'd drive up there in Adam's truck, break down these pallets into like, little boxes, walk them into our brewery, and then we could fill them. You know, So just that willingness to grind, and it was just all manual labor at that point. There wasn't as much strategy, you know, we had very little social media presence, um, really for the first year, the focus was just trying to get a couple local cafes to carry us, um, and hoping that the word spread from there. Uh, real quick for most of our listeners, I want to give you context. So the neighborhood Hamden that these guys are referencing, that's actually where the three of us were last week at the food market. Uh, and it's a neighborhood that's just North of where we're sitting right now in Remington in Baltimore. Um, so for you guys, um, I'm curious, like, uh, well, you know what, Justin, go ahead. You had your finger up and then I'll follow up. Sure. Yeah. So my question for the three of you in the, it was about a year of hustling before it started to maybe reap some kind of benefit, right? Is that kind of the timeline you were following? Yeah. So you're kicked in you're inspired and every night you're coming in there. How do you save yourself from burning out when you're you're going, I guess this was like a seven day a week kind of operation. Did yeah. you take a break? Was there personal, did you have a personal life? Were you able to go do acupuncture across the street? So I don't think we've had personal lives since 20, 2013 then. Um, but I think it was just the encouragement we were getting from the traction we were gaining. You know, we may not have had a social media presence, but whenever we'd walk in a store and someone would try it, they all enjoyed it. Everyone who had had kombucha would really encourage us and say, you know, this is the best kombucha I've had. And it was really easy for us to be inspired because Adam had created such an incredible product for us to go out. Very so. rewarding. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I would even add, actually, um, a, a big part of what at least kept me going was Sid, right off the bat, did some financial projections for us, which to this day have been, I mean... It's crazy. He did these in 2014, and we are like to a T still on the path. Sid keeps coming through. <laughs> now we know why. Yeah, yeah. But that's that's good to know because at least you guys had some sort of vision for what was possible. Exactly, and that was a big part. Like we knew the margins we had. We knew the potential that was out there. I did the market research in terms of like how fast the American market for kombucha was going to grow. Every year that we've been in the company, those projections have just gone up and up and up. Uh, actually, almost at this point, tripling what we first started. And an another thing that made it easy for us to really see, you know, the direction this market was going 
was what was happening on the West Coast. You know, the West Coast is such an incredible indicator for what's going to happen in food and wellness. And the kombucha market had already really exploded out there. And, you know, over here, you really only saw Synergy or GTs. Um, but what you've seen is more and more local brands and more s smaller brands taking that market share. It really mimics what's happening in the craft beer industry. That's a good point. And, and I know our listeners are kind of familiar with the Beatwell work I do, which is uh, it's, it's drumming group experiences, uh, but you know, often through a, a mindfulness meditation experience through rhythm. And for me, it's the same thing. It's like just follow the patterns, you know, and you look at what, you know, a Google or a Facebook, uh, the professionals they're bringing into work with their employees, uh, you know, it's meditation that trickles down to mainstream culture. Uh, you know, and, and, and to your point, uh, yeah, it's kombucha thing. Uh, that's why I referenced early, like why now? Uh, but I think for our listeners, all you have to do is just open your eyes and see what's working, you know, because there's, there's so much market share. There's so much, uh, just land, you know, like in, where we live, you know, so you guys can do this and hold it down in Baltimore and then grow regionally from there. Um, but if, if someone's out there in uh, Montana, that are, like, they have open land too. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's, and that's, it's not just for kombucha or for meditation, but for any service or product. We feel really strongly about that, actually. Uh, we, we think that any business, especially a business like ours that deals with a live product, should be absolutely local. It's, uh, I guess to give an analogy, it's, you know, if you're going to go get a dog from the SPCA, you're not going to fly to Oakland to get the dog. You're just going to get it here. Same thing. We really believe that it should be a local thing um, and it should employ local people. And in that sense, expand the brand through the social circles of the people you employ. Yeah. And I'm really glad that you mentioned the idea of meditation. So I meditate every morning. I think it's incredible. It gives me a lot of clarity. Um, but that type of mindfulness is really what you're seeing in the market. You know, people want to see um, products that have stories behind them. They don't want products from these enormous brands like Coca-Cola and Pepsi. And that's why you see those brands becoming more like venture capital firms. They're buying these smaller brands that really have products that can benefit society and have a real story behind them. How do you compete against, uh, I think, Pepsi bought Kavita, mm -hmm. right? Like a sparkling probiotic style drink, which is very similar to what kombucha is doing. How do you conjure up the idea of how can we compete against that? Or do you just feel like, hey, we're in a whole different world uh, and we're doing our own thing? So that was actually uh, part of our marketing strategy right off the bat and something we realized very quickly when we got into Whole Foods. In Whole Foods, we are one kombucha in a sea of other kombuchas. And a lot of times, you know, they're paying for shelf space. Um, so what we've done, which really ties into our values as people and as a company, is we've really gone out and talked to local business owners and focused on getting products to small cafes and small grab-and-go, uh, you know, like lunch spots. And corner pantry. Yeah, exactly. Like corner pantry. Uh, so we really focus on having building real relationships with these local business owners and forming this community. Um, and it's opened up tons of opportunities for us, but we offer uh, delivery, we uh, self-distribute. And so our distribution goes straight to these places. Uh, a big hurdle for us was distribution. We had lots and lots of problems working with other distributors locally. And by self-distributing, we were able to overcome a big hurdle, which is large order minimums from these big distributors like Cisco or UNFI. Uh, a lot of times they have like $500 order minimums. What we've done is lowered it. So we actually offer a two case minimum and you can even mix and match flavors in the case. And that way these restaurant owners and cafe owners that have very, very limited uh, cold storage are able to order weekly from us and we've been able to outcompete a lot of these big brands that simply just cannot do that. And also, instead of like like spreading ourselves across a very large terrain, I mean, we're concentrating on smaller areas and just saturating those areas, um, which helps us distribute, self distribute, and have smaller. And, and to put really all this in context, um, for people to understand the challenge of the distributing kombucha 
is that it has to be refrigerated at all times. So you can't just throw it in your car and swing by the store. So that's why we really had to focus on that. And we've really catered our entire distribution model to working with these mom and pop shops that really bring jobs to this area and care about the environments they're operating in. Well, and it seems like you make it really hard for these small business owners to say no, because you're saying, look, buy two cases of, the, uh, cases of this here. Try, I would imagine you're letting them tr- taste the flavors too in the process. Um, uh, I guess my question is, at what point though do you, um, do you try to, and, and maybe you don't, but at what point do you try to get the larger purchase orders? Um, and, and for example, with a place like the corner pantry, now I don't know what kind of storage they have in the back, um, as far as refrigerator space, but up front, that small refrigerator really isn't that big. And every time I'm there, there's more stuff in there. There's, there's, yeah, there's, there's other products, not, and and not kombucha, but you know, they have other of their own food products in there. So knowing that, how do you grow in those individual places, which will then lead to larger growth overall. Yeah. So, um, it's kind it's all a numbers game, right? So for us, we developed this strategy because like you mentioned, larger purchase orders, a whole foods will sell way more than a corner pantry, right? But there's also 20 corner pantries for every whole foods. So if you take, look at it from that perspective, you can move a similar quantity while working with smaller places. But in those stores, how we try to move more is really, you know, doing demos in the store, pouring free samples for people, um, and putting up any signage we can that indicate we're a local product that's brewed just a few miles away. Um, And we're also cause-driven. You know, for every bottle, we're donating to the National Wildlife Federation. We're really showing these companies that you don't have to be large to give back to your community. And you referenced this earlier, just that you guys, there's a story around the business. There is a culture around the business, and it's your guys' personalities and passions that are part of this brand that you've created. And I think that's what helps you compete with, you know, a big box kind of retailer type of, uh, you know, product. And I'm curious, uh, is this just a, a series of conversations you guys had, or was it hey, we need to figure out what the brand of Wild is. I think in a lot of ways, the brand really reflects our own personalities. You know, it's pretty rare to find a company where three people have known each other since they were 14 years old. You know, there's always been a lot of trust, a lot of honesty, um, and in general, a lot of transparency. So we just pass that on to our customers. And I would say it was a, it's a pretty fluid situation in terms of how we've, come up with our branding it was it was a very organic uh uh method that we you know we would kind of have a have a sketch pad and figure out you know some ideas and what what looked good to us what sounded good so it was a pretty fluid uh fluid branding process um when we first started the labels looked completely different we weren't you know uh actually initially we were thinking <laughs> Initially, we were thinking of having it be called It's Kombucha. And then, you know, after getting some feedback, decided that'd be super confusing and throw a lot of people off. Can you imagine trying to Google search us and we're called It's Kombucha? You just never come up. You know, so we did work through very early on, you know, what we wanted the name of the company to be. Um and we actually printed its kombucha labels. Yeah. If you scroll far enough down the wild kombucha page, you can find those. And it's definitely a good thing that we didn't go with it because it was not only a confusing name, but it was also grammatically incorrect with the apostrophe. So before Sid ca- <laughs> <laughs> before Sid came on, was there a name for what you you were you doing? Mobtown Fermentation, which is the name of our company, which Adam had as as the company beforehand, which is the website URL. Yeah. yeah. So that's the name of our company, um, but we really, I mean, our, our branding and our product is Wild Kombucha, and that's really what we've pushed. Um, yeah, that the parent company is Mobtown Fermentation, and we've thought about the idea of releasing other products down the road as well. I like that you guys are patient, though, on that. Uh, especially, I'm sure, like, oh, fuck, we landed Whole Foods. Now, like, what else can we sell them? 
So I think it's smart that you guys are trying to do your one thing right and building a brand and a culture around that that you can then leverage with other products or services. Um, so I'm looking at your website right now. It's beautiful. It, it's state of the art. It's contemporary, and uh, and we got some recognition over there. So wait, so who you got? You did this yourself. You guys said, yeah, correct. Much, yeah. yeah, for the most part, we did the website ourselves. Um, because we just realized when we were working with designers, whenever we wanted to change any little thing, it was such a hassle. So we were, we thought, why not go with Squarespace, where you can really just type it in and, you know, embed whatever text or video you want. And and what I like, you, uh, you at the top, there's kind of five buttons, and it's one, it's our kombucha, that's the product. But then you have the story and the mission as well. Um, and, and not all companies would think to have, or to make even a distinction between those two things. Um, so let's start with the mission. What is the mission and, and why that mission? Yeah. So our mission from day one has really been to make kombucha more approachable for people as a way to give back to our community, right? To make it more approachable, you know, more accessible, you know, Baltimore is a very polarizing city. Uh, Maryland's one of the richest states in the country, but yet you see so much poverty in this city. So we really wanted to make kombucha accessible to all of these, all of these communities so they can have a healthy option. And when we say community, we think it goes beyond just people, which is why we really incorporated the National Wildlife Federation um, to really help, you know, the animal habitats, whether it's our local Chesapeake Bay or a lot of these national parks that don't have as much funding. Um, so, so for us, it's all about community and just supporting the community around us. And we actually, you know, when we first started this, something I noticed when I was doing the market research was how pigeonholed kombucha was uh, in terms of the marketing and branding. It was very much branded to a specific and rather small group of people. Um, so not only with the flavor and the taste, but with our branding uh, especially, we've really tried to cater to everyone so that average Joe can just see this and grab it and not be intimidated by, you know, a strange label, a strange bottle. We want to be uh, a bit more urban and, uh, let's say, clean cut. Or I really relate to you guys and I appreciate what you do because, you know, I'm trying to sell fucking drum circles you know, and it's hippy dippy <laughs> as fuck. You know what I mean? And the same thing with the kombucha culture in general, if you're going to stereotype it, right? And for a good reason. Um, and, and that turns most people off. Uh, so I, I think it's smart that, that you guys uh, are intentional in, in how you present the product and how you guys represent yourselves as a business as well. Yeah, I think, I think for us it's all about you know, outwardly just being ourselves. We're three normal guys who started a company together on a family recipe and have just been fortunate enough to see this community support us and allow us to thrive. And for us, kombucha, we don't necessarily market it or see it as this elixir of life that'll cure all of these these ailments. We see it as a healthier option for people to enjoy. And yes, it does have health benefits, um, but we want people to be able to grab it also just because they think it tastes good. You're not pushing how it's going to like alter their chakras. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's cool. Um, go ahead, Jess. Kombucha is not always the, uh, the cheapest drink option that's out there, right? And it's kind of, I'm sure it's hard to figure out what price point can we get everybody involved? Mm -hmm. What kind of thought process goes into, obviously there's, you know, there's a back end to this. And you have to got to think of your overhead. But how do you keep it affordable so that everyone can afford to enjoy the experience? Yeah, so we've come up with a few unique ways of doing it. First of all, when we started, we didn't price our product for what was viable for us. We priced it based on what the market was, was dictating. But also on that note, you're right. At the price point kombucha's at right now, in general, it's not accessible to everyone. So we've made tons of efforts um, to bring our prices down to make it accessible. For example, people can buy kombucha directly from our brewery at a price significantly cheaper than any store. And that's really important to us because typically when you go to a brewery, you're paying the same price or sometimes even a little bit more for the premium of seeing the tanks for some reason. Um, I was going to say, to put it in context as well, 
um, we when we first started, we were bottling everything by hand, doing everything by hand. It was super small scale, and our kombucha at Whole Foods was being sold for was it twenty or thirty? Thirty cents more than than the largest brand of kombucha uh, on the market from a company that does about four hundred million dollars in sales a year. So we tried to get it as close to that as possible and still be able to maintain like you know some some semblance of overhead. When you guys got into Whole Foods, how many Whole Foods initially were you picked up by? One. And was that the one here in Mount Washington? Yeah, it was the one in Mount Washington. And the story of how it happened is actually pretty hilarious. So um, we picked a month and we sent Adam or Sergio or both to that Whole Foods every single day with a cooler on their shoulder looking for this one buyer, the regional buyer. Mm Mm-hmm. And when one day he just happened to be there, and obviously we acted like it was a coincidence, even though everyone who worked in the store had seen us there every day. <laughs> and we got him to try the product, and he loved it, and picked us up right on the spot. So obviously, a lot there has been a lot of serendipity, but that was really just willingness to be standing in that store every single day. Sure. And then how about now? How many Whole Foods are you in locally at this point? Right now we're in 12 Whole Foods, um, so primarily in Maryland and D.C. Okay. So that was, that was my next question, which was, are you, obviously Baltimore is home, Maryland is home. That's where you're really passionate about. You're pushing the, the, the local agenda, for lack of better terminology, uh, which is really great because to have this here I think is, is, is awesome. I mean, it's a great product. I'm proud of, to have it here as well and to Thank have you. this be the, the place you. it starts. Um, but is the goal to get it nationwide at some point? No. Okay. So our goal from day one has always been to be the best kombucha in this region. We're a firm believer that when you send food a certain distance away, the quality just goes down, you know? So we want to be the best kombucha in, in this mid-Atlantic region. We really believe in like a spoken wheel model for business. Uh, we think that's, that's really important for local communities. And by, what I mean by a spoken wheel model is having uh, our brewery and then drawing a circle around that brewery and then not going outside of that. Um, and then, you know, if we ever were to expand, which is not in the, the works at all right now, uh, we would absolutely want to have another brewery that employed local people in that area and then, again, draw a circle around it there. Right, and that was going to be my question. Like, what if, what if, somebody, um, what if somebody's here, you know, uh, home from college, right, they, and they go to school in New York or some other state, and they come to you and they say, hey, we love this. Um, I also have experience with brewing like, and fermentation, uh, would you be willing to figure out some sort of franchise thing so that I can open a brewery and create that same kind of... You guys are... It's funny. For those that are listening, they're all like looking at each other and smiling and <laughs> like they've gotten this question or like, or like you've thought about this before. But essentially, there, there seems to be an opportunity for that to occur. Is that something that you are open to at some point, even though it may not be part of the plan now? Or are you a little bit hesitant because the minute it gets out there, it's a little hard to keep your hands on? I think down the road, if it was the right opportunity, we'd be open to it. But I don't think we would franchise in the traditional way. Like we would always want our hands there, you know, trying that product, making sure that that product coming out of that brewery is wild kombucha, not just kombucha. Okay. So with the understanding that you want to keep it in the region. Um, and I know you mentioned the projections are like really on point. They're very realistic and I would hopefully conservative when you started, but hopefully Absolutely. also yeah. realistic and, and they're yeah. growing. Um, do you, do you have, um, are you on track to reach the goals that you want to reach that would allow you guys to have a sustainable business, presumably for the rest of your lives? You know, if that, without, I mean, and I can even be more blunt. I mean, are you guys making money at this point to where you can um, have employees, where you have, it's not as uh, hustle bustle in the shop. Obviously, I would imagine at this point, it's, you know, it's many years later since you started, but is there still room for a lot of growth? 
Oh my gosh, there's so much room for growth. Good. But we have okay. come a long way from that juice shop. Um, so now we're operating out of Timonium, like you mentioned. We have about a 4,000 square foot brewery. Um, we're up to a, an 11 person team, including us three. Um, we just took on our first salespeople. So we're really making a push into that DC, Northern Virginia market. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's still tons of room for us to grow. You know, you look at the populations of this area. There's there's so many parts of Maryland that we haven't even begun to saturate. I was I was also gonna say, uh, I feel like we've we've definitely uh, talked a lot about how there was a lot of serendipity in it and a lot of things lined up for it. I also wanted to add uh, to the point of us, you know, kind of figuring things out and doing a lot of problem solving. In order for us to get the to get the brewery in Timonium and to move in there. Uh, we had to win first place in a business competition uh, out on the Eastern Shore. And we actually got to a point in the business, uh, I think it was 2016, 2015, uh, where it was we either won this business competition and took the next, took the jump to the next level, or it was that was it. Like we were closing doors and that was the end of the business. Can you, I mean, can you tell that full story? Yeah. So we were operating out of the juice shop still in February 2016 and we had outgrown it and we needed to get a new brewery. So we signed a lease for the spot in Simonium and we had the health inspector come up to take a walk through and no one had told us anything. And at that point he told us we needed to build two more rooms in our brewery and we had no capital to this day. We've taken no investment. Um, so what would that have cost? So that build out was going to cost us right around forty thousand dollars. It's a lot of money up. Yeah, front. and at that point we had about twelve dollars in the account. So uh -huh. we entered this uh, shore hatchery business competition on the Eastern Shore, and it was as Shark Tank as you can get. It was a one minute pitch, and the winner gets fifty thousand dollars. So, so actually, uh. Me, me and Adam went down there and did it because Sid was out of town at the moment. And uh, so Sid, Sid wrote up the, uh, the application, got us in there, and then me and Adam went down. And uh, I practiced this pitch over and over and over to the point, actually... I would I, shoot rubber bands yeah. while you were pitching. So, yeah. <laughs> Adam and Sid would throw things. They'd like turn on music or have a cell phone ring. And so we get there, and it's like a room full of judges. Like Jim Perdue was there. Like a lot of very like you know big public figures in Maryland business owners, and about half a second into the start of the pitch, one of the ladies' cell phones started ringing, and it's I had a st like dead stop. The whole thing stopped. Everybody turned, and I like took a second and collected myself and was able to like go back and and say the whole pitch. And yeah, we won first prize and won forty five thousand dollars, and we're able to continue. So. So I have, I have two questions about that. Number one, I don't even think that would be on most people's radar to think that, hey, we're, we're kind of down to the last dollar. We're going to enter a contest. Maybe now that Shark Tank is a little bit more popular, they might think of like, maybe I can go do something similar. But first, who comes up with the idea that we're going to find a competition to enter or was this already on your radar? And then number two, being a... Uh, you know, a student of McDonough where I went to school and Jordan did two years, did the oratories or, or the orations, did that, you know, giving these like speeches where you had to memorize a piece and then go up and, and just recite the whole thing, did that, is that where you drew your inspiration and not mess this one up? Uh, so yeah, that, that really helped uh, the oratory classes of McDonough. And then I actually remember, uh, so my, my parents are from Peru. I, I speak fluent Spanish. And so I took a course in college that was oratory in Spanish and obviously there's a lot of like, I don't know, I, I speak fluently, but I've definitely studied English and taken oratory class in English. So taking oratory class in Spanish really made me focus on a lot of little like minute details about how I felt, kind of my, my uh, like, men like mentality you go into it. If you get stumped, how you are able to overcome that. And that really, both that and then the oratory at McDonough were the two big things for me. And then the idea to apply for the program, uh, for to apply for the contest was really kind of split because between me and Adam, because both of us had gone through entrepreneurship programs. 
and he'd done a business competition. I had done a business competition. So we thought, you know what? Maybe there's one that's open to people that aren't just in school. And you weren't giving up any part of the company. This was just a prize. No, they they literally handed us forty five thousand dollars and said, "Have a good day," and no equity was. So actually, uh, it's the Radcliffe Foundation. Definitely want to give them a shout out because, uh, especially Carol Radcliffe, she donated a million dollars to the uh, G- Purdue School of Business in Salisbury University, and they hosted what was called the Shore Hatchery Business Competition. It's uh, I'm not sure if it's over at this point, but it was five years, uh, twice a year, and once in the fall, once in the spring, uh, and. It was a total prize of about $100,000 per competition split between, uh, I want to say it was like 10 businesses that won, starting from like, you know, $1,000 to, to $45,000. So if that hadn't worked out, would you guys have quit? Because uh, you don't seem like the type that it would just have failed. I mean, would you have gone the friends and family route? Had you already exhausted that idea? Um, had you thought about potentially finding an angel investor? to do a small round like that? So I think one thing that really makes anyone successful in business is just that you're scrappy. You know, you'll find a way no matter what. Yep. And I'm a firm believer that if we didn't win that competition, we would have found a way, whether it is that friends and family route or whether it is going a traditional business loan route, we would have made it work because I feel like by that point we had realized we're on to something. I would say the just in general the the two biggest uh, things for us personally as as people that have made us thrive and what I really attribute our success to is uh, number one our chemistry as the th- you know as partners but uh, also number two our ability to problem solve arguably more importantly uh, our ability to problem solve I would say is the number one reason why we've been able to get ahead. Yeah, I definitely agree with that because. All three of us have very different minds. You know, I'm very quantitatively driven. You know, I want to see the numbers to support what we're going to do. Um, while Sergio is a lot more, you know, trusting his gut and, and going going that route. Um, while Adam, I mean, he's sometimes the off the wall guy. Like he's <laughs> he's definitely he's definitely the wild card creative yes. mind. You know, behind our flavors, and you have to have like that type of vision and that type of you know, outside of the box thinking to bring something to market, that'll be different. So it's funny as we sit here and face you guys, it's almost like a mirror image because there's three of us who have been doing this project for 43 weeks now. And same thing, we clearly have different personalities and different ways to to come at, uh, you know, solving problems and, and creating. And the three of us have had to learn how to effectively communicate with each other and kind of figure out, okay, Justin's strengths lie here, um, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, how, how was that process for you guys? You seem cohesive now. Uh, you've had many years to, to work at it. Uh, were, there, were there moments of difficulty in, in communication? Oh, ab- absolutely. I mean, <laughs> the beauty of being like so close as a group is that you're not afraid to, you know, rip each other's heads off, but at the end of the day, you know you have the best intentions. You know that you're all on the same side and that you want the same thing at the end of the day. So there's going to be times where you disagree and you're adamant about your side of that argument, but you have to realize that both of you or all of you are working towards that same goal. So um, what is the current status? What's the strategy right now? What are you guys working on right now? Aside from getting product sold either at the brewery or wholesale or you know getting it out there, what, what is the strategy right now? So we're working on developing some new flavors and really trying to be more entrenched in the community. You know, we're planning on getting involved with events, local organizations, and we're trying to do a similar thing down in DC where we're just entering. You know, we're partnering with local distilleries and cocktail bars to do events and different, you know, really, really introducing kombucha as a versatile product rather than just a probiotic that you drink after yoga. Okay. That, that's, that's, um, I think that's smart. And you mentioned also bringing on three salespeople now or two. So we actually, uh, I 
just finished training the second salesperson um, and put together a little uh, sales office on the mezzanine above her warehouse. Um, just, yeah, put some curtains up and printed out a map of D.C. That's like a three by four foot map of D.C. to stick some pins in and really be able to visualize uh, where we're, you know, what areas and what neighborhoods we've got a strong presence in. Um, so, yeah, one of one of the salespeople is actually uh, me and Adam's brother, Johannes. Uh, he was our first salesperson. He actually started off doing demos for us and helping us in, in the brewery when on bottling day. Um, but at this point, we are branching off into our kind of individual roles that we'd visualize from the get-go, um, kind of our spheres of influence. And at the beginning, like Sid was saying, all of us, it was all manual labor all the time, whereas now we're really starting to focus on our separate spheres. Um, I'm definitely at this point like 100% sales. Uh, I still do about a half day of bottling on Mondays to help out. But uh, yeah, basically just training the sales team, helping them out, going out myself. Uh, Sid, his role is really focused on uh, having people drink our product, whereas my role is more, you know, getting stores to carry a product. So Sid's focused more on the, you know, social media aspects, on branching out and having uh, like bigger contacts. For example, he just graduated from the uh, ten, Goldman Sachs 10,000 small business program and is like their golden boy. <laughs> like, <laughs> they are inviting him to everything. We're actually doing a um, a pop-up event in DC, which actually you can... Yeah, so they, uh, they rented out Union Station, so where the trains come, and we're going to get to just pour kombucha for people to try, you know, on their commute to work. It's great exposure. And then I'm going to get to kind of hang out on Capitol Hill and meet with some of the senators, Warren Buffett, and a couple of those guys. And then uh, obviously Adam is doing research and development. He's, uh, he's the brewmaster. So he's the one who comes up with new flavors, is always experimenting, you know, getting our shelf life up. And Adam, you're the musician, the touring musician, correct? Yeah, that's correct. So it makes it you're the, the mm -hmm. artist of the group, per se. Yeah, yeah. Um, where, you, what instrument do you play, by the way? Guitar. Okay, yeah. and the band is? Uh, I'm in the Flying Eyes and Black Lung. Okay, I've yeah. heard of both, and both are still active? Yeah, they're both still active. The Flying Eyes are kind of winding down at this point, actually, but Black Lung is still very active, yeah. Okay, who's the singer of Black Lung? Dave Cavalier. He's also that's, a very good drummer. That's I know what Dave, I thought. Yeah, I know Dave yeah. Cavalier. He's a great dude. He's All actually right. good at everything he does, and it's actually it's very annoying. <laughs> he's, like, he's better than me at guitar now, I think, maybe. And he's a it's, fantastic bar, uh, bartender. That's true. It, he came up with uh, some of our award-winning cocktails yeah. that we now serve. Very cool. If, if Dave is, is listening to this, I'd like to publicly thank him. Uh, many years ago, uh, he, he passed on a handful of his drum students to me. It was very, very generous yeah, yeah. of him. So that, and I, that was one of my questions. Um, you know, it seems like you are coming up with the secret sauce. You know, you're, you are the, at least the initial creative mind behind the product itself, the, the taste that people taste. Um, how do you balance touring and business? I know personally it can be very challenging. You it know? is extremely challenging, actually. Um, and uh, it's and how do you guys in the deal beginning? With it? How, what kind what kind of <laughs> communication? Um, you know, in the beginning uh, when we started, it worked, but we never thought we would reach this point. And and it's kind of been a um, it's kind of been a recent um, development that I definitely had to really think about pulling back on on my my touring, um, but kind of. Um, it kind of came hand in hand, like the flying eyes are now ending and it has nothing to do with this business, actually. It was just kind of a mutual thing between the whole band, which leaves me one band, which is a lot more manageable and could work for now at least. But music has to be kind of on the back burner at this point. Well, I was going to ask you, I mean, how important is touring to you versus Wild Kombucha? Touring and playing music was more important to me in the beginning, but now... Honestly, wild kombucha definitely is the most important thing in my life. Yeah, that's the point. That's great. I'm, I'm sure I'm, you guys love that. Yeah, yeah and I mean, it, it makes sense. You know, when we started, we all had other jobs. You know, no one, 
no one saw it getting to this level. Like right now we're in 280 stores in five states. Wow. When you're bottling on the side of a juice bar, juice bar, you don't see that coming. When did the 250 number come about? How long ago was that? 250 was about a month and a half to two months ago. And that was a big celebration. I saw a lot of posts about that, right? 250. Yeah, de- definitely. But now it's already 30 more. Yeah, I mean, it's like the growth is happening. What's going to become, what's going to probably feel like exponentially, right? And that was yeah. before our sales team. E- yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Having the sales team, we're expecting to hit right around 750 to 800 by the end of the year. So do you think a lot of that is attributed to the flavors itself being different from the normal kombucha flavors that seem to be out there. You're not going with lemon and ginger and cayenne and like all these like traditional, maybe more of like from the herbal medicinal stand, right? Where it's like, oh, these are tonics people used to make and now we're throwing them in the kombucha. It's all kind of going together. But you're going with, I mean, like apple spice and watermelon hops. I mean, this is very different. Yeah, it's geared towards um, just like the average person and not like the niche kombucha um, person that that likes you know like lots of herbs and spices in their kombucha and like cayenne and things like that. Um, I try to whenever I make a flavor, I try to make it as approachable as I can. It really goes into our overall branding and our overall mission. Um, we really don't want people to to think of us as this like very niche product. We want it to be something that everybody can can enjoy. And I mean, making those sales is always easier when you're creating a product you believe in and when you truly understand that what you're doing is making kombucha more accessible to people rather than adding more and more complicated things to make it more confusing and intimidating. And actually, it's, it's funny. Um, when, I, when I worked at uh, Thompson Creek, you know, sales for them, you know, trying to convince people to redo the windows in their house, you're going to get about like 500 no's for every yes and like you're really like it's a lot of like negative. Uh, whereas here, when we started doing sales here, I was like, oh my god, this is a piece of cake. Like you're bringing people free samples. Like you're everybody loves you when you show up. Whereas, oh, it's funny that that was gonna be my next question. What happens when you get a no? And how <laughs> and, and and how often does that happen? Hey, it doesn't happen often. Uh, to be honest, when we first began, uh, I, I was. So used to getting no's that it wasn't a big deal, but I think we're a little spoiled now. Uh, Because now when we get a no, it's like, whoa, whoa, why? Like, you know, it's like we really like think about it and try to use it as an opportunity to figure out how we can improve uh, and really how we can how we can grow as a company and what we're offering to clients. And I think um, so. Sergio had experience with sales at first. Um, but I was out selling as well, and I didn't have experience with sales, you know. Um, so for me, I definitely took it personally. You know, this is a product we really care about, and this person's saying no, but it felt like they're not saying no to the product. They're saying no to everything we're trying to do. Yeah, it's hard when when you are so connected to it and don't have the experience of getting a door slam in your face, you know. Um, but what have, what have been the reasons? And, and have you encountered places... This is this is like a fun challenge that I'm seeing in my mind. You go to a place, they say, "Well, this is great, but you know, I actually am already carrying someone else's product." You know, uh, and there really isn't room for two. Has that happened? Oh, a- absolutely. And I how mean, do you beat them? Yeah, I think for us, a lot of it's been the fact that we're local, we're cause driven, and the service we'll offer just exceeds what they can. You know, you walk into any store. And you point to every beverage in their fridge and you look them in the eye and you ask them, when is the last time the owner of that business walked in here and talked to you? You know, and that's really powerful for them to understand that you have a direct line to the owner. If anything goes wrong, we will fix that for you. Um, But like I was mentioning with the taking it personally, if someone says no, I think that's also been a strength. You know, we were never that company that just shrugged off a no and moved on. We always asked wait a minute, why'd they say no? And is it within our power to correct that or improve that? To piggyback off Matt's question, um, it's, and I can think of, um, I'm like thinking in my head, all the places that only sells your brand of kombucha, there's only wild kombucha, right? So I'm thinking moms, or not moms rather, because they've got a bunch of them, but I'm, <laughs> but I'm thinking uh, Nally Fresh. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking about the corner pantry, which we talking about. I'm thinking about Atwaters. Yeah. I think yep. only carries your brand of kombucha. 
who came up with the strategy that, okay, now we're in a bigger shop like a Mom's Organic or we're in Whole Foods. Now, how do we fight for the spacing so that even though we're the local guys and you want to see us over GTs or someone else, who comes up with the idea of how do we get there? Or was it uh, Adam and Sergio going there kind of like the same with the, with the cooler where you're waiting for the guy and you're just kind of like moving their stuff away and you're putting yours to the front? Yeah. <laughs> so it is allowed, right? It's allowed. It is funny because right? yeah. we've been scrappy in some of those stores. Um, but yeah, originally it started with Adam and Sergio going into that Whole Foods. And then we really got into Mom's Organic in one of the luckiest events of all time. So the regional buyer happened to go to Harmony Bakery in Hamden, try our product, and then reached out to us. But when you get into these stores, they put you in the worst spot of all time. Like, but Don't you oftentimes have to pay to play? Like pay yeah, for your spot yeah. on the shelf? So, so Coca-Cola pays, and a lot of these bigger brands pay to be at eye level, right? Because that's the best spot to be. So <laughs> what we would do is when we'd be in there pouring free samples, sometimes we'd move our bottles up to the eye level, and the person stocking the shelves doesn't feel like changing it at that point. So they keep stocking you at eye level. assumes that's where it's supposed to be. Yeah. 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 So then that's how we would get really good shelf position. And then that would increase our sales. And then we would actually officially get better shelf position. And Moms is great for a company like you guys in that there is a specific tag next to the prices and what do the different flavors are that it's, it's a, a picture of the state Maryland and it says local in big yeah. bold letters. So it's like, Oh, this is brood. And I even I go to the one where I live and it says how the distance, like exact distance, it's like in miles, here's how far the brewery is from here. Yeah. If you're trying to buy sustainable local and support local goods, this is your brand. Yeah. And and to give you an idea of how how really small this community is, once that buyer for moms had reached out to us, things kind of stalled a little bit. And I ran into my first grade teacher. I went to first grade in uh, the Washington Waldorf School. My first grade teacher is actually very good friends with Scott Nash, who is the owner and CEO of Moms. And she actually put us in direct contact and we started emailing back and forth. And within the next, like, I think it was a day or two, uh, the regional buyer emailed us again and brought us in instantly. Seems like your enthusiasm really has an effect on people. And I, I don't think you can discount that for the amount of yeses that you're getting and for the serendipitous situations you find yourself in. Um, and this is something that we've heard time and time again with a lot of our guests who have worked extremely hard on building their businesses and uh, doing it from a, a center of passion and real, real connection to, to their product, you know? Um, and I, I, I'm bringing this up because a lot of our listeners struggle with finding that passion, you know? Um, and it seems like you guys have, you know, have all done other things and have all have had other passions. Um, but if, if you could tell someone who is potentially struggling with trying to find that, you know, maybe they have all the skills in the world, but if they need to find um, what is their passion, you know, what should I do? put my energy into what should i double down on what would you guys say because it's so clear to me it, it just it resonates from you that you understand that for yourselves three of you all being so connected in that what would you tell someone who maybe doesn't know uh, i would say look around you and you will very quickly see areas of need in all sorts of places find one of those and try it out like the best way to get ahead is if, if you're even if you're not, if you don't know your passion, if you look around, you see an area of need and start helping people and help, you know, by helping other people and doing it, even if you're helping yourself and making money, like if you are fulfilling a problem, if you're fulfilling a need for people, you will always have a place. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with what Sergio is saying. I think a big piece of when people say I'm looking for my passion, um, I'm looking for my place. I think a lot of people are trying to find um, a place where they're needed or a place where they feel that they're impactful and making a difference and wanted. Um, and I think that even extends beyond just us three. You know, if you look at the other people in our brewery, because we did not build this company alone, like we absolutely have not. Um, and those people have the same passion and the same understanding that we're here building something special. This isn't just another beverage company. It's a company looking to make a difference 
um, in a community that hasn't had a lot of positive news, you know, like let's build something that can put a smile on people's face and make them proud to be from this incredible city. Who are the, uh, the people that now are part of your 11 person team and how did you connect with them? Are, are some friends that have been on board from the beginning? Are they all that way? Are there people that have just kind of come in and been like, I need a job and you don't know me, but fuck it. I mean, so what's, the, yeah, like feel free to, 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 you know, give some props to, to these people. Um, cause I'm genuinely curious how they got involved and what that is like for them. Like, do you guys provide benefits? Do you, how do you figure out what to pay them? Is there enough coming in that you can support yeah. them and support yourselves? You know, I'm just, I'm curious about the, the, the financial structure in some ways, but also just the culture that obviously drips down from the top from you guys. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the culture that we've really instilled in everyone is that we really put the mission of this company first. You know, you're looking at the three lowest paid employees at Wild Kombucha right now. You know, we've never put ourselves first. We always put them first. If they deserve a raise, they get that raise long before we do. Um, and I think they see that and they see our willingness to work and that we value them to that degree. Um, so Amanda Boutwell was our, is our oldest employee and she's just incredible. Like she, anything that we can think of that needs to be done, she figures out a great way to do it. Um, she pretty much handles all of our invoicing, all of our graphic design, um, as well as helps on our operations side. She's really just like a full-out operations manager. And on top of it all, she's a phenomenal artist and has brought in tons of her artwork into the brewery and just like transformed the space. Our office is completely different because of her artwork. While you're on this, is the brewery open to the public? Yeah. There's a place to come sit down and, and try the product? So we're still very like startup feel, right? You walk into our brewery and you're comically just in our office, but we do offer brewery tours on Wednesdays and Thursdays because I think kombucha is a pretty mysterious product and almost no one offers tours of their kombucha brewery. We're one of the only open ones like that and we think it's important for people to see the process and almost understand its simplicity. How do you how do you deal with the issue of potential contamination from bringing people in, in that you're dealing with like a live culture as your product? Yeah, so they're only allowed. Oh, people are only allowed to come on Wednesdays and Thursdays because we're not processing on those days. So we work on a weekly schedule. So Mondays and Tuesdays we're um, bottling and brewing respectively. So on Wednesdays and Thursdays, you know, everything's in the tanks, everything's put away. And we'll bring them in wearing hair nets and making sure like everyone's washed their hands. You know, we, we maintain a, a very serious level of cleanliness because we're treated as a food processing facility um, instead of a brewery from a licensing standpoint. I'm gonna come in on a Wednesday. I'm, that sounds. I'm great. coming in. Hey, on we Wednesday. should take a field trip. <laughs> Dude, come on in, guys. Yeah. 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 It is Wednesday. You guys can try some of our uh, unreleased flavors that we have at the brewery. So perfect. Uh, I want to open up questions in the Facebook group, uh, facebook.com slash groups slash chocolate croissants. Uh, we got a few and uh, specifically to the flavors. So our bud Ryan S. Denti, who's actually been uh, helpful with us behind the scenes in the past month. Uh, one of his questions, first of all, he says he's a fan uh, especially apple spice and watermelon. And he's curious, uh, how do you guys decide what makes the cut and gets put into production? Yeah, I mean, I usually have like anywhere from five to 15 flavors going at once that I'm experimenting with. And then I'll get it to a point where I think it's perfect and then I bring it to the team. He's and very And they bashful. just like tear me apart. <laughs> and I go back to the drawing board and, and then I really perfect it. At that point, with their help, is it like yeah. a focus group essentially? Kind of, but the focus group is just our our employees with way more tears. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And do you yeah. do you ever put it out there to people who aren't employees to get the feedback of? Well, yeah. Once I mean, we passes, would, we would we would love to do it. Yeah, we will. We will. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah we will sure. happily be your guinea pigs. Yeah. Cakes. So we we yeah. definitely do. So we'll always have like we mentioned unreleased flavors on tap, and when anyone tries it, we'll. We'll casually ask them, you know, what do you think? What would you change? And we found creative avenues actually for for introducing unreleased flavors. We actually make the house kombucha at Pure Raw Juice. 
So all those flavors you see there <laughs> are unique flavors from us that we're thinking about releasing. I guess that's not but a we want to see how people react to it's kind, it. Kind of our beta testing. So speaking of the three of us being uh, the Boyd the Bunny uh, test bunnies for you all, Ryan also followed it up with, um, he says he's a sucker for design and packaging when it comes to products. He says that he does love the bunny logo. Is there a story behind that? And I think there was a contest. Boy. There was a contest that was <laughs> no, ran for this? Not, oh, not, with, not for the bunny, but um, there's an artist that lives in Berlin um, that did a lot of art for um, my albums that I put out with, with my different musical projects. And... He's been amazing through all of that, and, uh, and he was, and he, I asked him to do it, and he gave us a bunch of different varieties of, of designs, and we chose the bunny. There was a naming contest. Was that what it was? Oh, a naming contest. Well, yeah, yeah, not a draw, not a logo, right? It was a naming contest. Yes, yeah. there was. And who was the winner? So the winner was. <laughs> so, so the winner was actually um, a guy I know from grad school named Mike Gruber. And I'm just gonna jingle bell for right. Mike out there. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to Mike. Yeah. So this wasn't like you guys already had a name, no. and you're like, no. well, let's just promote it this way, cryptically, by hey, let's get everyone involved. Hashtag the bunny. Yeah, and we just we were just looking through names, and um, we came across Boyd, and we thought it was just an incredible fit. Everyone started laughing, and then we're like, yeah. okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it came down to that, and uh, Mr. Frosty Paws. Well, what was the one Julia gave? <laughs> I think it was Mr. Healthy Paws. Mr. Healthy yeah, Paws. Frosty yeah. Paws is that is that dog treat. <laughs> right, right. It's Mr. Healthy Paws. Yeah, <laughs> but, I, but while we're on the topic of our branding and packaging, I definitely want to give a shout out to local Baltimore artist Sarah Tomko. So our original packaging um, had like a little bit more of a Western feel. And one day Sarah walked into our brewery, uh, looked us in the eye, told us she loved our product, but it looked like three dudes designed it in Microsoft Word. Um, so, so she told us she would design new labels in exchange for kombucha. Little did we know at that time that she had experience designing food labels, and she came back with the beautiful packaging you see today. And once we realized that we were going to use them, obviously we told her we wanted to pay her fairly. And we were blown away when we saw when she sent it to us. And it, it makes a huge great. difference because someone like me, I don't know much about you know wine or, or like liquors, but uh, it's or kombucha. But if I'm going to go to just say a mom's, like I'll go based off good design because I, I I would trust if they like have good design, then they might have good taste. At the end of the day, you can have the best product in the world, but if nobody picks it up off the shelf. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally with Jordan when it comes to something like wine. I have no idea what I'm looking at or what kind of flavors I'm going for. Uh, but I do know that aesthetics, to me, make all the difference. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's incredible how subtle differences in packaging can demonstrate such different ideas. You know, you look, I think the wine industry is a great one to look at. You can see how someone who's trying to operate in the, the cheaper priced wine, how they brand versus the ones who are, tr who are more expensive, and they immediately communicate that to you without you reading a word. It's pretty powerful. Uh, for those listening, if you have Netflix, I don't know if you guys have seen uh, the series Abstract, where each episode looks at a different art form, uh, but one of them is graphic design. Uh, it was cool. really cool and inspiring to watch. Um, Keep digging into these questions in the Facebook group. Uh, our bud Maria down in Austin, Texas, uh, she's very well versed in kombucha. She taught you about it, Justin, or how to do it? She taught me the ropes. Um, so going back to, to the, the actual product, she's asking, uh, where do you source uh, your ingredients for your flavors? Um, are they local, sustainable? So we use all organic ingredients to make our kombucha. Um, and we do have a locally sourced flavor. So our apple spice is completely locally sourced. And we designed that for the, the Woodbury Kitchen restaurants. Some of our other flavors, it's a little bit difficult to locally source things like mangoes and grapefruit. So unfortunately, those aren't locally sourced yet. But we do use as many local vendors to make our product as, po as possible. For example, our labels are from Gamsey Lithograph out of Baltimore, our bottles we get from Andler Packaging, another local company, and the boxes they're delivered in come from Willard Packaging, another local company. That's really cool. And, and things I wouldn't have even thought about, just other things you are sourcing yeah. and utilizing. That's, that's really cool. 
Uh, Maria also asks, uh, have you ever made a brew with a Jun, honey-based culture, J-U-N? I don't. <laughs> I actually, We're all looking I to you, I actually haven't tried that yet. Um, I, I ordered a Jun culture just out of curiosity, and then we got so busy, so <laughs> I wasn't able to keep up with it and try it, but uh, I'm planning on doing that, actually. And she also asks, what's the biggest culture you've ever grown? The biggest culture. Um, I think our biggest SCOBY was maybe like it's probably yeah. tank size, probably so it's like three feet. It was like probably three like or about four feet. Three feet in diameter, like a yard. Maybe like a, a, a half an inch to an inch thick or something. It was like actually we have a post on social media of us holding up a SCOBY and you can see it. I'm holding it up like this. <laughs> Adam Adam, if you had to name that SCOBY, what would you name it? SCOBY Dick. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you guys mentioned um, you guys mentioned that you source the tea leaves from China. Is that correct? Yeah. So we use a company called Star West Botanicals, um, and we use their fair trade gunpowder green tea. It's also organic. And where do you? I mean, is that just through a local distributor, or rather a U.S. distributor, or do you travel? Um, well, we we order direct from them, so they. They ship. They are a U.S. based company that that imports from that region, um, and the reason we chose that is because that region is traditional to kombucha, w- which is where it actually started. Uh, the story of kombucha is actually pretty interesting as well. So actually, uh, yeah, kombucha originated about roughly two thousand years ago in ancient China, and uh, from from what we can tell from the records, it seems like it was invented uh, for the emperor. Uh, and it was called the Tea of Immortality. So it was kind of this, like, that's, I think that's where it gets a lot of the, like, elixir and that kind of, like, qualities to a lot of the marketing now. Um, but actually, uh, there's this legend about the name, the way it got the name. Uh, and around 415 AD, uh, there was an emperor in Japan named Emperor Inkyo. And he was very, very ill. And a Korean physician by the name of Kombu was called over and sailed over to the island of Japan and uh, prepared a fermented mushroom tea and ended up healing the emperor. And so cha in Japanese is tea. And so it became kombu's tea, so kombu cha. And it became wildly popular, especially among the elite classes like the samurai. Uh, And actually, the samurai considered it a form of chi, like a form of life energy, and would actually take flasks of it into battle, kind of like uh, Gatorade or Red Bull for athletes now. Damn, I just feel like I sat through a TED Talk. <laughs> <laughs> and that's history brought to you by Sergio. And, and, and it's so, <laughs> this is why you guys are having success. It, it's because y- you live it, and, and there's, there's, a clear, there's a clear attraction to it. Uh, there's a clear passion for it. There's a clear desire to, to know it. And to live it and to and to share it, uh, it's really impressive. Thank Thanks. you so much. Uh, last question, uh, our dude Michael uh, Marone, Justin, you've been doing some work with him. We have, and I think this question is right up the that alley. Okay, I also saw he was at Raw in Brooklyn. So good on you, Mike. Good man. Good we, man. We were pumped about uh, uh, two things: Sean Waltman, yes, at, and Razor Ramon. Fuck yeah! And there was a one, two, three. Chan. But no gold dust on that episode. I don't yeah, think. You know, gold dust was there. He he was at the end uh, protecting the ring from yes. the Strowman. Yes. And when I, he was like rubbing on people. He's the wild card. That's what he does. <laughs> He's always, that's you. That's what he does. That's why, yeah, I get it now. <laughs> yeah. It's so, all coming full circle. So, Michael, uh, up in New York, I believe, uh, yep. he's completely ignorant to kombucha. He's never even heard of it. Uh, and But he's into tea. Uh, he says, and and he says, from his limited research, he can't find any scientific evidence of concrete health benefits. But uh, he wants to learn more. Definitely, I mean, I think when anything is in the early stages, especially with food, you know, you live your entire life. So to prove some, like that one product is causing improvement is almost impossible. You know, you're going out; nothing's controlled. You go out in your environment. You exercise. You eat different things. Um, however, you know, there has been proven science to indicate that improving your gut flora has so many positive impacts on your life, whether it's improving digestion to even improving mood. So I would actually add, uh, I I read a very interesting article. Uh, my fiance is uh, a special ed teacher at Parkville 
and she sent me an article uh, about this thing called leaky gut syndrome, which a lot of kids with autism have, and there is a direct correlation, and this is, you know, this is an Eastern medicine particularly, they point out this direct correlation between mental health and gut health, and there, in the article I read, they did this test on, on a couple kids with autism where they would drink kombucha, take probiotics, eat yogurt, and their ability to function and to relate uh, and their uh, social capacities tremendously increased uh, when their gut flora increased. And something I just observed uh, from a lot of her kids is that a lot of these kids would eat chicken nuggets and pizza and are very, very picky eaters to the point where their diets suffer tremendously from it. And a lot of the times their parents who I'm sure are super weighed down already in terms of like all the stuff they have to handle, uh, they, they don't really focus on that and allow these kids to eat whatever they want. Um, and it was, it was very interesting. It made this link between gut health and uh, mental health. Yeah, a lot of times they refer to the, uh, the second brain as the brain mm-hmm. that's in the gut. And I know Jordan would always say, he would always say, trust your gut. And it's one of those things that you can really take literally because when you do feel something bubbling up, when you feel butterflies or, or a good feeling or whatever's going on in there, nerves, you, know, you can really tap into that and trust it over your heart where you might be a little more irrational. You can rationalize a little bit more with what's going on in your gut. And so, yeah, of course, if you are eating chicken nuggets, you're eating a highly processed uh, fried foods, right? You're going to end up, you can, you can ruin your gut biome. You can ruin what's living within there, right? It can start kind of feeding off itself and, and almost like catabolizing, yeah. right? And if, so if you are taking things and there, it, it's interesting because there, is, there are a lot of current, there's a lot of current research and studies of people trying to figure out probiotics. Should we be taking these probiotics? Is it worth it? Are they actually still living when they're sitting on the shelf versus you talked about your product is living, Right, this is a living, breathing. You know, it comes from a scoby, so it's some kind of like symbiotic culture yeah, of this bacterial absolutely. yeast, right? And it's like we can get all this good stuff, but there's still a debate. Why is there still a debate? Um, I mean, I would I would point to like the debate between saturated and unsaturated fats. Like a lot of times, it's just it's people's opinions, and it takes time. It takes years and years for people to realize the effects. Um, but actually, an, an analogy I would give to what you're saying about uh, probiotics. Uh, for example, when you eat a, an orange, there's certain uh, amino acids and vitamins in the orange, in the peel, in the in the fibers that help you absorb the vitamin C to a much greater degree than if you just take a pill. Uh, the same thing goes for kombucha. A lot of, uh, especially elderly people, take uh, probiotic pills and when you drink kombucha, there's a lot of acids and vitamins that help you absorb those probiotics to a much greater extent. So your body, and not to mention that it's nicer to have a tasty drink than just to, you know, pop a pill. Yeah, the bioavailability. And, and I think a lot of that comes into, I think a lot of people refer to that as the matrix. The matrix of, say, the, the fruit, that it's not just that, and a lot of people get misconstrued. They're saying, well, I'm trying to like cut down on my sugar intake. Right, and they don't realize that well. It is sugar, but then there's all this fiber, and it's naturally occurring yeah. sugar, and then there's all the other, you know, uh, micronutrients, whether it's vitamins and minerals that come along with it. I think that's where you're going, which is really cool to think about the bioavailability, and that you can have a drink that will quench your thirst, and will also maybe help you to kick the soda, which is just full of processed sugar and then carbohydrates, right? And you can have something that's way more natural and actually really good for you. Yeah, I mean, I think the best thing I could tell the person who asked this question is to go out and try it and see how it makes you feel, you know. Um, it, it's really tough to indicate with a study exact causation, but the easy thing to see is what the market has dictated. You know, these hundreds of millions of people are going out to drink kombucha because of how it makes them feel and how it affects their body. It's the quickest growing segment of the non-alcoholic beverage industry for a reason. And I would even add, uh, at the end of the day, I think a lot of the reasons that these uh, food science debates go on and on and on is because everybody's body chemistry is different. So that's it, Sid is absolutely right. You just have to go out there and see what works for you. Um, everybody's different. Everybody has, you know, has has 
not only different genetics, but also like different predisposition to different foods. Well said um, and well reasoned. Uh, We've taken an hour and a half of your guys' time. We're very appreciative of it. Uh, As we start to shut this down, uh, I'm just curious individually uh, with this company or even outside it, just in general, what are you guys individually most excited about? I'm kind of obsessed with problem solving. And even if we, whatever level we reach, I still want to be involved in a very direct way like that. And I'm just excited to continue doing what I'm doing now. Even if it means, if this company somehow gets like sold or something like that in, in the future, I would want to start something else from scratch and then do the same thing again of the journey. For me, I'm most excited about building something in a different way. You know, every beverage company that we see around us goes the same sequence. They grow a little bit. They partner with a distributor. They they don't really have control over their product, and they try to sell in as many states and as far as they possibly can. We've built this company in an extremely grassroots way and showed people that you don't have to go that big box route to do something to do something well or do something great in your community. And we've also demonstrated that you can build a sustainable, profitable company by focusing on the people and you know the ecosystem around you rather than always focusing on, you know, what's the glamorous areas like like New York or LA. You know, we've done this in Baltimore and we're extremely proud of it. Uh, I would say I'm most excited to just share everything we've learned with with other people. I'm I'm what I guess as a person, I'm not super great at coming up with like like Adam, I'm I'm not super great at coming up with like new ideas. I'm really, really good at expanding on things and like blowing them up from where they were to something much, much bigger. So I'm really excited to share everything we've learned with as many people as possible and hope that this gets not not even this particular uh, business, but just the, the model and everything we've learned and, and this kind of sense of community that we've been able to build. I really, I'm just very excited to share that in as many ways as possible. It's been a priceless experience to yeah, start yeah, a company. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and we've shared with our listeners even just this chocolate croissants project as a podcast and as a Facebook community right now. Uh, just the process of doing it makes us so much better, uh, and and it influences anything else that we have going on or we'll do in the future. Definitely, I mean, I think the one thing that we see in your podcast that we like to communicate with our company is there is no replacement for authenticity. You know, if you're real. People can feel that and people know that. Well, you guys seem like real deal entrepreneurs to me. Um, you know, you, you can spot them and it's rare. It, I, I, at least in my experience, it's rare. I've seen, I, I run into people all the time who are starting businesses or they run this business, they run that business, they're trying to do this thing. Um, it's so obvious that you guys are the real deal from the product to everything that's come out of your mouths to how you carry yourselves to the chemistry to the fact that you guys not once disagreed on anything that was said um it's there's a lot uh there's a lot there so it's been inspiring for me to see um tonight to to get to hear you guys speak to get to talk to you it definitely makes me feel even more invested in your product it's something that i think all of us will continue to um you know we're going to absolutely support it but we're going to talk about it you know and we're going to tell people about it and we're definitely going to come to the brewery um, you know, and I'm going to like wear like, you know, disguises. So, you know, you're I can gonna get look great in a hair net. I can't wait. <laughs> I'm just going to come multiple times. You're not going to know it's me, you know? Is he, is he, hey. he doesn't have any hair, dude. He doesn't have huh? hair net. I can't tell with that the hat. <laughs> <laughs> he has a fro under there. Hey. Uh, you don't know that. Hey, I wanted to give a quick shout out to the rest of our team. We got kind of sidetracked. Give a shout out to my main man, Bobby. He is... He is like hey, Bobby. the Swiss army knife of wild kombucha. Um, give a shout out to Dane and Caitlin, who are the demo team. Go out there and, you know, meet people face to face. And uh, then definitely give a shout out to my squad, the sales team, Johannes and Ava, both in terms of sales, relatively new, but they're killing it. Very excited to have them. Is on there the a way. name for the squad? 
I heard this. Am- I've heard this amazing. For- fortunately, not. I, there, no, there should can be. You guys, can you guys. Well, no, 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 no wait. Name? Hear me out. There, there is this amazing <laughs> jujitsu practitioner coach, uh, John Donaher. And he, his his squad is the Donaher Death Squad. Ooh. It's so badass. I think you need to have one. You need a name. The Mollerine Maulers. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> Sid comes through all the time. Yeah, yeah but I, I definitely also want to give a shout out to everyone who has ever grabbed a bottle of wild kombucha yeah, off the shelf. Um, you guys allow us to do what we do and go to work every day and try to make a difference. Sergio's sales surgeons. <laughs> <laughs> Can we get a couple more? Jordan? Jordan? Uh, Dude, I'm just thinking about gold dust, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> That's all you should be thinking about all yeah. the time. Are um, we going to sponsor him or what? I wish. Uh, so Adam, Sid. Jordan or gold dust? No. Jesus both? Christ, Justin. A combination of both. <laughs> right. Adam, Sid, Sergio, thank you guys uh, for coming over, for giving up uh, your time, uh, knowing that you guys are so busy. Uh, I honestly had no idea what to expect tonight. Uh, this was, uh, it was truly memorable for me. And I leave uh, with more energy and more inspiration. So I want to thank you guys for that personally. Thank you so yeah, much. thank you. And definitely, I mean, keep sharing these inspiring stories in Baltimore. I mean, we definitely definitely could use the positivity and I think people, people will feed on that. Yeah, people latch on. And I was actually in the same boat as you. I, I had no idea. Sid told me about it today. I, was, I had no idea what to expect. So yeah, thank you guys. This has been awesome. Awesome. So uh, Wild Kombucha is the product. Uh, MobTownFermentation.com is the website. Uh, and this brings us to the end of episode 43. Uh, as always, for all of you listening, we are uh, so grateful for your attention and for your support. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to Chocolate Croissants, uh, we ask that you consider doing so. Open up your podcast app, search Chocolate Croissants, hit the subscribe button, and that way you won't have to use your data when uh, you're taking the commute to work or listening at the gym to these episodes. Uh, also, if you find value in these episodes, you can rate and subscribe at iTunes. That helps us a lot. We'd appreciate it. Uh, Matt looks like he's ready to contribute something else. Uh, I just wanted to have these guys with Law Kombucha tell everybody their socials please yeah, yeah so our instagram handle is wild underscore kombucha and our facebook is just capital wild and then the word kombucha and our twitter handle is just wild kombucha so support them matthew finger and up if you're going to get to the point where you talk about next week guests yes. I, I have some information i can share share please okay it's going to be one of two people okay uh depending on schedules it's gold dust. Please. <laughs> please tell me. Uh, I got to let you down. It's not gold dust. But it's going to be either, um, either Eric Willis, who is, who's been my longtime tattoo artist, who is local to Baltimore. Uh, he has put ink on a lot of people around here, and he's one of the best there is, I would arguably say, in the world. The dude is amazing. So it's either going to be him, uh, but he is leaving for a two to three month trip on he's going to be riding motorcycles all around asia for two to three months so it may not work out if not then we're going to have uh, matthew uh rosie rosenblum who is along with many other bands peripheries tour manager uh who will be on the show so one of those two guys and they both have awesome stories cool Looking forward to it. Uh, So that'll be episode 44 next Monday morning. In the meantime, join us in the Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash chocolate croissants. Uh, Would you guys join us in there? I'm sure some of the... Yeah, uh, absolutely. absolutely. Some of the people in there may even have some questions to follow up after listening to you guys' story. Yeah, we'll hop in there and answer any questions people may have, especially after listening to the podcast. If we inspire any any questions, uh, we'll be in there. Awesome. And if anybody has uh, questions for us, we encourage you to come ask them in person at the brewery. There we go. Very, very well done. Uh, guys, we did it. Did it. That was <laughs> it. It was six of us. We made it happen. Uh, it, it seemed pretty natural. Uh, and for you still listening, you did it with us as well. So we thank you. Uh, we'll see you in the Facebook group. Uh, until then, never forget the name of... Bye-bye.